The story of the Seattle Mariners is extraordinarily weird and it takes a very long time to tell, so let's not waste any time. This story begins the only way it ever could have begun, with 140 acts of arson. Robert Bruce Driscoll, seen here in handcuffs after he was finally caught in 1935, was a transient who had struggled to find work in the wake of the Great Depression. This era engendered hatred of the rich and capitalism in general in many people, including Driscoll. In the New Deal 1930s, while those in power were busy trying to cobble together a kinder, gentler type of capitalism, Driscoll took a more direct approach, setting stuff on fire. One official described him as, quote, the most dangerous pyromaniac ever known on the Pacific coast. Over the course of several years, he destroyed at least $18 million worth of property in today's money, indiscriminately setting fire to factories, lumber mills, churches, and a baseball stadium. Dugdale Field was a small but adequate ballpark that served as home to the minor league Seattle Indians. Late at night, on July 4th, 1932, Driscoll gathered some game programs that were lying around, used them to set the grandstands on fire, retreated to a nearby hill, and watched the whole thing burn down. When it did, the team was forced to relocate to Civic Stadium. The thing to know about Civic Stadium is that it couldn't really be called a field because the term field implies grass, which Civic Stadium didn't quite have. The playing area was almost entirely dirt. It was described as a mud hole, everyone hated it, attendance cratered, and the Indians were in serious financial trouble. The person who kept the team in Seattle was Emil Sick, a local beer magnate who bought the team in 1937 and renamed it the Seattle Rainiers. Among the promises he delivered on was the construction of a brand new ballpark built right on top of the burned down Dugdale Field. It was described as one of the finest on the continent. In other words, it was a sick stadium. It was named Sick Stadium. We move forward now to the 1960s when Major League Baseball is playing musical chairs with American cities. It's the perfect time for Seattle to try and lure a major sports team and thanks in part to our arsonist friend, Sick Stadium is there to serve as the bait. The Cleveland Indians, Milwaukee Braves, and Kansas City Athletics all express interest, but plans to expand the ballpark to Major League capacity fall through, and discussions stall out. The Kansas City A's end up moving to Oakland instead, which makes a very important person very upset. Missouri Senator Stuart Symington is furious over losing the A's, and demands that the American League put a team back in KC as soon as possible. In 1960, he lost the Democratic presidential primary to JFK, and it's been alleged that Kennedy was all set to pick Symington as his running mate until Lyndon Johnson, again, allegedly, blackmailed his way into the position. Whatever the case, Symington ultimately receives a consolation prize in the founding of the Kansas City Royals after Symington threatened to pursue legislation that would jeopardize Major League Baseball's precious antitrust exemption, which essentially allowed it to operate as a monopoly. This could have cost MLB tons of money, so they caved in and the Royals were born. Now, the Royals were scheduled to begin play in 1971. Since the American League wanted to expand in pairs, they awarded a second expansion franchise to Seattle with the estimation that three years and change was enough time to renovate Six Stadium into a major league park. But Symington raised hell. He didn't want to wait three years for the Kansas City Royals. He wanted them now. Desperate to escape his wrath, AL owners met in the middle of the night and bumped up the Royals' opening day by two years. And the same applied for Seattle's new team. In the strangest way, it had all happened. A serial arsonist necessitated the construction of a new stadium that decades later, served as the bargaining chip necessary for Seattle to land a Major League Baseball team. In 1969, the Seattle Pilots were born. Pilots are gone. So, after their maiden voyage in the Pacific Northwest, the pilots took off and headed east to Milwaukee to become the Brewers, which is completely asinine and nearly unprecedented in the four major American professional sports leagues, but not completely unprecedented. And in fact, ironically enough, the lone other instance of an MLB team up and leaving their original city after a single year also involved an organization known as the Milwaukee Brewers. They were MLB's worst team, struggled to draw fans, and incurred massive debt. So they were sold for 40 grand and moved to St. Louis for a while before eventually settling in as the Baltimore Orioles. Over in pro football, the Chargers spent their debut season in Los Angeles in 1960 
and simply couldn't generate enough fan interest as the LA Coliseum was generally about 90% empty for their games. When San Diego swooped in and offered a temporary place to play for free, the Chargers packed their bags and headed two hours south to forever make moot the issue of no one in LA caring about them. Meanwhile, the Dallas Texans won a championship in just their third year of existence in 1962, but hated sharing a market with the Cowboys so much that they still bailed immediately after that to Kansas City and renamed the Chiefs. The closest anyone came in the NBA was when the team now known as the Washington Wizards kicked off their first couple years in Chicago before relocating to Baltimore and adopting the Bullets moniker, while the Rockets only made it four years in San Diego before shoddy attendance resulted in a sale that had them Houston bound in 1971, which, given their astronomical name, I could have called from day one. The Tri-Cities Blackhawks did move to Milwaukee after two years in the NBA, but they'd been around for a few years prior in a league known as the NBL. And in the NHL, after just two seasons, the Kansas City Scouts were hemorrhaging money, which led to their sale and move to Colorado before ultimately becoming the New Jersey Devils. So the Seattle Pilots becoming the Milwaukee Brewers joined just the Chargers and Milwaukee Brewers as truly changing markets after their initial season. They were the last ones to do it. And now more than a half century removed, it's hard to imagine they won't remain that way forever. The reason they left really wasn't that complicated. As a minor league park, Six Stadium was fine. If they'd had enough time to prepare, they probably could have built it into a serviceable major league stadium. They did not have enough time, and Six Stadium was an absolute hellhole. Thanks to Senator Symington's impatience and a rough winter, the renovation project derailed. They'd managed to slap together some bleachers, but builders were still scrambling to put them together on opening day. Fans were lined up waiting to get in, and once they finished building a row of bleachers, they let a few more of them through. The visitor's press box had an obstructed view of left field, and whenever a ball was hit there, announcers had to turn around and watch the game through a mirror. There was nowhere for photographers to set up, so they had to take all their photos while sitting way up on the grandstand roof, which probably explains why there are so few photos of Seattle Pilots home games. But what really did them in was the plumbing which worked pretty well when it accommodated around 10,000 people. Over the years, whenever it drew sellout crowds of around 14,000, it typically had a little trouble with overflow. But at its new 25,000 seat maximum capacity, the stadium became a biohazard. The whole place completely lost water pressure. Players had to go home or head back to their hotel rooms just to take a shower. Concessions workers couldn't wash their hands. Toilets wouldn't flush. And since the toilets wouldn't flush, they had to lug in portable toilets. The pilot's former PR director, Bill Sears, once recalled a story. The morning after a night game, a team employee walks past some Porter Johns and he hears pounding. He unlocks the door and outruns a terrified man. Stadium workers had locked the doors, not realizing he had passed out inside. He'd been trapped there all night. Six Stadium was torn down just a decade later and the place where it once stood is now occupied by a Lowe's. Out front, near the loading area, there's an unceremonious little monument to the pilots, a stand-up of a batter propped up next to the original location of home plate, holding eternal watch over a flock of lumber carts. It's so obviously in everybody's way. It's got to be a matter of time before some fed-up employee rips it out and throws it in storage. But for the moment, it's here. And it's all that remains of the one and only season of the Seattle Pilots, one of the worst ideas in the history of Major League Baseball. Let's take one last moment to appreciate that this stadium is literally named Six Stadium, and then close the door on this chapter forever. As quickly as the Seattle Pilots came, they were gone. However, anticipating the arrival of the Pilots, the city had, in the late 60s, already allocated funding for a brand new stadium. Seattle was so determined to land a baseball team and an NFL team that they broke ground on the site before the city was promised either one. The King Dome was a cavernous, all-purpose indoor arena with about three times as many seats as Six Stadium ever had. It wasn't blind faith, though. A lawsuit, first threatened in 1970 as a means of keeping baseball in Seattle, had spent all decade looming over the American League. It finally went to court in 1976. And for the second time in 10 years, the league responded to a lawsuit with a resounding, fine, whatever, 
and granted Seattle a brand new baseball team. To name the team, they turned to the public and asked for submissions. The winning entry, Mariners, was submitted by a Bellevue man named Roger Smotis. The team announced that in recognition, Smotis would be awarded season tickets, but they couldn't find him. They went to his apartment. They left him messages. After several weeks, nothing. Roger Smotis had vanished. So far, we've been unable to dig up any evidence that he was ever found. But thanks to him, we have a word for whatever it is the last 43 years have been. This team was delivered to us through arson, political strong arming, poopy toilets, a lawsuit, and a missing person. Every team has its highs and lows, frustration, heartbreak, greatness, and confusion. But no other team is like this one. The Seattle Mariners are eminently lovable, profoundly human, and stunningly, outrageously weird. You may not buy this yet, but believe us when we say it. There is no more fascinating team across the entire history of American sports. Those Mariners began play in 1977, and I love their first year so much. Here, we see their game-by-game -game timeline. In game number five, they fell to a losing record and never again made it back to 500. And thanks to a late season slide, they finished their first campaign with a 64 and 98 record. But my favorite part about it is how often they just laid down for their opponent. On nine different occasions, they lost by double-digit runs when no one else in MLB that year outside Atlanta absorbed even half as many bludgeonings. Five of those nine Seattle disasters came in August, too, meaning they accomplished within a single calendar month what 24 of the other 25 teams didn't throughout the entire season, a season that set the tone for their first decade of existence, which, by the way, featured 40 such whoopings. They lost at least 95 games in six of their first 10 seasons, and were on pace for a seventh were it not for a strike-shortened 1981 season. Altogether, they lost 924 games in that period, over 60 more than anyone else. A look at run differential is an even scarier sight. Powered by five dead last in MLB finishes in their first 10 seasons, they allowed nearly 1,400 more runs than they scored in that time, which is over 70% worse than the second worst team. Needless to say, they never even sniffed the top of the AL West to gain entry into the postseason. This green bar indicates the record of the division winner that season. In other words, the number of wins the Mariners would have needed to reach the playoffs. Excluding the strike campaign, they finished an average of 26.7 games out of playoff position each time the curtain closed on a season. Year after year, their September games were about as meaningful as the human appendix. Even worse, whereas plenty of teams at least have some star power or reasons for excitement, the first era of Mariner baseball lacked in all that. In none of those 10 seasons did the Mariners have a starting pitcher with an ERA under three. They didn't have a player reach even 30 homers in a season until year nine when Gorman Thomas hit 32. The very best players that had come through their organization were pretty anonymous names that would have been merely run-of-the-mill players on virtually any other team. Their top pitchers were guys like Floyd Bannister and Jim Beatty. Their best bats during this time were perhaps Bruce Bochty and, even though he didn't even peak for them until later on, Alvin Davis. If you're familiar with them, you know they weren't exactly folks that put asses in seats. If you're not familiar with them, well, they weren't exactly folks that put asses in seats. So, why in the world would anyone watch this team? If you choose to appreciate sports simply in terms of winning and losing, there is nothing for you here. If it's meaningful drama you want, you're out of luck. 
Even if all you're after is a narrative arc of any kind, I'm sorry, we're sold out. All the early Mariners have to offer is a scattering of bizarre stories, most of which involve some form or another of fraud. Toward the tail end of the 1980 season, Mariners pitcher Rick Honeycutt had a once promising season spiraling away from him. Through 10 starts that year, he was one of the league's best pitchers, had an ERA under two and a half, but then by late September, he was reeling. His ERA had ballooned to nearly five across starts 11 through 29, leading up to a ball game in Kansas City. In the third inning of that one, Royals left fielder Willie Wilson tripled off him, and while standing on third base, noticed some happenings on the mound that smelled fishier than a stroll through Pike Place Market. Wilson urged the umpire to check out both the ball and Honeycutt's hand. Sure enough, in an effort to combat his recent struggles, he was discovered to have taped a dang thumbtack against his finger to cut the baseball. That's gotta be one of the stupidest, most obvious ways to cheat, just even in a vacuum. But Honeycutt made it worse. So much worse. Honeycutt somehow just totally forgot about the presence of said thumbtack, rubbed his face, and in the process lacerated his forehead, almost poking his eye out and leading to a 10-game suspension. Naturally, once his playing days were done, Honeycutt would eventually go on to have a lengthy second career as a pitching coach. The next Mariners season, the strike short in 1981, is one of the dumbest seasons imaginable. At first, they're managed by Mari Wills, who has parlayed an excellent career as a shortstop into one of the most disastrous managerial careers in the history of baseball. Mari Wills was baseball's equivalent of the modern-day venture capital startup guy. Despite never having managed a baseball game, he wrote a book claiming that he and he alone was going to disrupt baseball and guaranteed that he would turn a last-place team into a World Series champion in just four years. Well, you can see how that went. Among all those who have managed at least 50 games, he has one of the worst winning percentages we've seen since World War II. And among those who began their careers in the 80s or 90s, he's the worst by miles. In terms of strategy, managing a baseball team is far less complicated than coaching a football or basketball team. So what does it mean then to be a bad manager? Leave the demonstration to Mari Wills, who found every conceivable way to be bad at his job. For one, he was always full of it. When Rick Honeycutt was thrown out of that game after the thumbtack incident, Will said he didn't understand why he was ejected because the explanation was confusing. There was no way that was a confusing conversation. It goes something like, your pitcher taped a thumbtack to his finger and you're not allowed to do that. But Will's never seemed to own up to anything. Everything was always someone else's fault, usually his players. They couldn't stand him, and they were only kind of joking when they suggested that they should start losing games on purpose to get him fired sooner. Wills was this odd combination of authoritarian and checked out. The authoritarian side of him would wake up his players in the middle of the night to make sure they were in bed and chase after kids who caught home runs during batting practice. The checked out side of him would talk about starting players who had been traded away a month ago and head for the airport in the middle of a spring training game. As skipper, Wills made so many tactical errors that it would take another 10 minutes to go through them all, but one stands alone as the most thunderously stupid idea of his managerial career. Prior to a home game against the Oakland A's on April 25th, Wills pulls aside the team's groundskeeper and tells him to illegally paint the batter's boxes longer than the rulebook specifies. It now sticks an extra foot toward the field. The alleged benefit is that one of Will's hitters, Tom Pachurik, will get a little extra room to step forward as he swings. The drawback is that during a baseball game, there is a person whose job it is to stand right here and stare at the field. He's known as an umpire, and he's been standing here for three hours a day for many, many years. If anything looks different, he will immediately recognize it. So, in Will's desperate effort to keep the Mariners from getting caught for something, he 100% guarantees they will get caught for something else. When they do, and he's suspended, he says he's shocked and dumbfounded. Yeah, man, me too. I thought that was going to work for sure. He's fired a few weeks later, ending one of the funniest managerial stents ever. He's dumb, says Brad Golden, the Mariners journeyman catcher, who, by the way, is traded to the Yankees shortly thereafter. Golden ended up in Seattle in the first place because the Yankees traded him there for a player to be named later, which is a fairly common practice in baseball. It turns out the player to be named later is Brad Golden, 
who returns to the Yankees and becomes the second player in baseball history to be traded for himself. Also in that 81 season, more fun stuff in a Mariners-Royals game. In the sixth inning of their May 27th affair, KC center fielder Amos Otis hit this little dribbler up the third baseline. Then, Seattle third baseman and part-time stand-up comic Lenny Randall did something you don't see every day. Something completely awesome. This. That's right. He got down on all fours and began furiously huffing and puffing and blowing at the ball in an effort to send it foul. And it worked. Well, sort of. His three little pigs routine did indeed manipulate the ball over the chalk. And initially, it was ruled a foul ball, with the home plate umpire unable to think of any specific rule against blowing the ball. But for the second year in a row, Royals manager Jim Fry was unamused by more Mariner ball-altering shenanigans, voicing his displeasure to home plate umpire Larry McCoy. Unfortunately, McCoy then changed his mind, refusing to just be cool and appreciate Randall's goof, instead awarding first base to Otis. This is something I've definitely thought about as it pertains to golf. If a putt stops just short, settling on the lip of the hole, I want to see golfers get down and blow it in. Randall, for the record, claims innocence, that he was merely yelling at the ball to go foul. Oh, and a quick note on Lenny Randall, who was a pretty weak hitter in his Major League Baseball career. After retiring in 1982, he resurfaced in Italy a year later, hit 502, and became the god of Italian baseball. But 1981 isn't through with the Mariners yet. Just a few days after Randall's heroics, we see Seattle right fielder Jeff Burroughs being tagged out at home by the Rangers' Larry Cox. Cox is wearing the Rangers' logo. Burroughs is also wearing the Rangers' logo. Two teams with the same hats. It's probably the only time this has ever happened, and I think it's great. Always makes me cringe a little whenever I see two baseball teams playing against each other because they would accomplish so much more if they were all on the same team and they worked together to achieve their goals, but... Sadly, the reality is a little bit more mundane. The Mariners' caps, helmets, and jerseys were stolen from the Rangers' stadium. They did at least have their practice jerseys, but they had to borrow some of the Rangers' batting helmets to wear to the plate. They also threw a third team into the mix by hitting up the stadium gift shop and grabbing Milwaukee Brewers' caps to wear in the field, choosing them because they closely resembled the Mariners' color scheme. This, of course, is because the Brewers stole the color scheme from Seattle in the first place when they packed up and left town. Anyway. Freed from the oppression of being the Seattle Mariners for one night, they win 5-3. In the standings, 1981 was yet another genuinely meaningless season of Seattle baseball, but it was a big year for a couple of Mariners. Reliever Larry Anderson had languished in the minors for an entire decade before pitching well and finally securing a permanent roster spot. In the next season, he finally got his very own Major League Baseball card. Whoops, they spelled his name wrong. 1981 was also the year manager Rene Latchman took the reins from Mari Wills, and although the Mariners finished well below 500, he earned the respect of his players and was kept on as the permanent manager for 1982. This, of course, earned him his very own baseball card. Whoops, they spelled his name wrong too. Now, both of these cards were from the Donruss Card Company's 1982 set. I looked through this entire 830 card set, and I didn't find misspellings of players on any other team. Only Mariners. This was no coincidence. Even to those in the baseball business, these guys were strangers. But not to us. Under Latchman, the Mariners' sixth season was their best yet. They'd managed to take a winning record all the way into August, which they'd never before come anywhere close to doing. But who cares? There were greater matters at hand. Because for Rene Latchman, this was the summer of Mr. Jello. News of the incident hits papers nationwide on July 4th, 1982, exactly 50 years to the day after Robert Bruce Driscoll's act of destruction set this endless chain of events into motion. The night prior, Latchman returns to his hotel suite in Chicago. It's a luxury suite, complete with two bathrooms and quite well furnished, but when Latchman enters, he finds that everything has disappeared. The paintings are gone from the walls. The furniture is missing. He reaches to turn on a light. Nothing. The bulb has been removed. Latchman stumbles in darkness to the bedroom and feels for his bed. It isn't there. The walls are empty here as well. How is this possible? Perhaps the bathroom light works.
All his furniture is piled up in the bathroom. He turns to look at the toilet. The toilet is full of jello. Latchman races to the other bathroom. The other toilet is also full of jello. He finds that the wall telephone is still there. He attempts to call his fellow coaches and players. He can hear them, but they cannot hear him. The mouthpiece has been removed from the phone. No one can hear his screams. Latchman sleeps on the floor that night. The next day, he dedicates himself to bringing the perpetrator to justice, offering a reward of hundreds of dollars for information leading to the culprit. This week, the Mariners will go seven games above 500, which the Mariners have never done and will never do again until 1991. But who cares about that? There is toilet mystery afoot. At first, Latchman suspects ex-Mariner Tom Pichurik, who now plays for the nearby White Sox and lives in the area. When Pichurik supplies a convincing alibi, the trail goes cold. The remainder of the season, Latchman is taunted by anonymous room service orders for plates full of jello that are delivered to his suite. Who would do this to the team's manager? Surely not a player who has every incentive not to get on his bad side. And yet, when the chief collaborator reveals himself at season's end, it turns out to be someone who had everything to lose. Larry Anderson, one of baseball history's all-time greatest pranksters, had talked his way into getting Latchman's room key and orchestrated the entire thing. After finally clawing his way into the bigs, Anderson is having an awful 1982 on the mound. At the time of the incident, his ERA is 5.91, absolutely bad enough to get him sent back down to the minors. And if that happens at age 29, his career is just about done. Why in the world would he give Latchman any more reason to ship him out? Well, listen, you've got to occupy yourself with something, and that something cannot be baseball. Because baseball is really boring. Let's move forward a few years to 1985. Going into July 9th, the Mariners were 41-40, and 40, entering the second half of the season with a winning record, an extremely rare feat for this ball club. They hosted Toronto that day in what was the 622nd game they'd ever played in a season's back half. But it was just the 26th that they entered above 500, the previous 25 coming in that 82 season. And as we'll see, they clearly had no idea how to conduct themselves in such unfamiliar territory. They got a rally going in the third inning with Phil Bradley in scoring position and less than two out for cleanup hitter Gorman Thomas, who banged this hit to right. Jesse Barfield fielded it and fired a beautiful throw home in time to get Bradley. But this one resulted in a massive collision with Blue Jays catcher Buck Martinez, who shattered his leg and dislocated his ankle. Thomas, a good pal of Martinez's from their three years as teammates in Milwaukee, tried to take advantage of that incapacitation by advancing to third base. Martinez still noticed and was able to get a throw off to third, but it sailed into left field where George Bell scooped it up and launched a throw home where Thomas was attempting to complete the 360-foot jaunt around the base path. And who was on the receiving end of that throw home? Why, it's the catcher who's still writhing around on the ground, completely and literally broken. No matter, he's got a job to do. Martinez hauls in the throw and applies the tag to his buddy who mercifully took his foot off the gas to avoid another collision. Thus, MLB's first ever 9-2-7-2 double play was born. The Mariners had done the seemingly impossible. They figured out a way to get multiple players thrown out at home by multiple different outfielders on the same play. Astonishing stuff from the M's, who would go on to lose 9-4, in the process kicking off a new multi-year drought of not entering any second half game with a winning record. A 1985 survey asked Seattle area residents to name their favorite Mariner. The vast majority responded that they didn't know any. Every Mariner's retrospective has to find something from this era to talk about, as much as we wish we could begin the story in the 90s. Usually the greatest achievement we can come up with is Gaylord Perry's 300th win in 1982. Even then, Perry was a journeyman who just happened to be a Mariner the day he did it. Oh, but lest you doubt he was a real Mariner, he'd be ejected and suspended a couple months later for doctoring the ball with Vaseline. 
Alongside Alvin Davis, the most recognizable player of the early years is probably Harold Reynolds, a two-time All-Star who was one of the best defensive second basemen of his era. He was also known for being thrown out on the bases, which he can't really be blamed for entirely. The Mariners utilized Reynolds, a very fast guy, as a very, very, very fast guy. In 1988, the consequence was the most counterproductive stolen base campaign of the last 90 years. Here is every player who's ever been caught at least 25 times in a season, plotted as a percentage of their stolen base attempts. In the 1910s, players went for steals with reckless abandon before everyone seemingly realized at the same time that it was a really bad idea. About 50 years later, stealing came back into vogue before everyone realized this again. Exhibit A was 1988 Harold Reynolds, who was caught 29 times against just 35 successful steals. In fact, Reynolds' top YouTube search result from his playing career is a clip of him being thrown out. It's one of the most memorable clips in Bo Jackson's endless highlight reel. From the warning track, he ignores the cutoff man entirely and fires an impossibly perfect strike into home. After the game, Reynolds was reportedly sitting in front of a VCR, watching it over and over again, trying to figure out how the hell it happened. This is how it was for the Mariners back then. They just kind of experienced the baseball other teams were playing. They weren't anyone's rival, they weren't even a national laughing stock in the way some other teams were. They simply did not register. As it concerns the Mariners, the only real important story was beginning on the other side of the country, in the Bronx. The year is most likely 1983. The Yankees manager is Billy Martin. Over the course of his managerial career, Martin got into a bar fight with one of his own players on multiple occasions. He busted a reporter's face open because he wouldn't show him his notes. He fought a stranger at a hotel bar after he insulted what the man did for a living, which was entirely inappropriate. There's absolutely nothing funny about being a marshmallow salesman. You go from town to town, probably have a suitcase with a bunch of marshmallows in it. Ugh. Point being, Billy Martin was perhaps the most difficult person in the modern history of baseball. On this particular day, as the story goes, a lot of the player's kids are running around the clubhouse, but two kids are singled out in particular. Martin sends one of the team assistants to tell their father, the star first baseman, that his kids need to be quiet. The player naturally takes it as an insult. So does his oldest son, who would be about 13 years old at this time. This kid will hold a grudge against the New York Yankees for decades to come. You know his name. <laughs> 